Hey folks, David Stewart here. Hope you guys are having a great day. I'd like to talk a little bit about Fafford and the Grey Mouse, or specifically the first volume of collected stories, which are called Swords and Deviltry. Now there's actually, uh, before I get into this, there's actually an earlier volume of collected stories that I think was from like the 1950s. This one was from the early 70s, I think 71 or 72. All the stories from that one from the 50s you can find republished in later volumes. I think the second volume of the, if you're buying the series now. So if you can't get your hands on that first one, don't worry, all those stories exist in other volumes. Um, so this was actually the second collection published, but really the first chronologically. And in it, you get to meet Fafford and the Grey Mouser. Uh, these two characters, Fafford, this barbarian, and uh, the Grey Mouser, aka Mouse, this uh, kind of sorceress, rogue-like character. And um, you get to have some adventures with them. So uh, I just want to do a little bit of analysis and explanation of these. If you're not familiar with Fritz Leiber or his career, he had a very long career. He wrote his first, I think, Fafford and the Grey Mouser story in the late 30s, which really puts him in the pulp era. Uh, but he continued working and writing up until his death in the 1990s. So he, uh, early 1990s. So he had a very long career where he wrote many of these stories with these two characters and with other characters as well. Uh, Fafford and the Grey Mouser are definitely heroes that are in the vein of Conan the Barbarian or uh, Cull, uh, which is not necessarily an anti-hero. I think they're more anti-heroes than Conan was, but they are characters who really seek for their own benefit and their own adventures and their own things. They're thieves, um, very, very much like out and out thieves, whereas Conan is more like a general adventure. So they're a little bit different from Conan in that regard. Uh, now, another thing about Fritz Leiper is that he coined the term sword and sorcery and these stories fit the bill perfectly. These are sword and sorcery stories. So if you're wondering where that term came from, he's the one who coined it. This is fantasy that's focused on the adventure and it's focused on uh, characters who are going on adventures for their own benefit, not necessarily trying to overcome a dark lord or engage in some sort of fairy tale action. So again, very much in the vein of Robert E. Howard um, and, uh, and his contemporaries as well. So what do you need to know about this story? Well, I think it's good and I think it's worth reading for anybody that is interested in fantasy. What you will find in this book and in the ones that follow is a lot of tropes that have become so ingrained in the fantasy space um, until you read this story, you won't quite realize where a lot of them come from. Uh, tropes like barbarians being from, you know, some frozen north and being part of like snow tribes and stuff, that's Fafford, right? And barbarians being super tall, um, as well as kind of sorceress rogue thieves, that's the Grey Mouse or Mouser, and there's a thieves guild and a big city full of smoke, um, which is going to be uh, Lankmar that the Thieves Guild operates in. All of these things that you may find in an Elder Scrolls game or you'll find in a D&D &D session or just a modern fantasy novel, they really have their origin um, right here in Fritz Leiber's, um, Fritz Leiber's fantasy world. And actually, I would say that one of the most reminiscent is, um, is actually Gardens of the Moon by Steven Erickson, which takes place in Daruzhistan, which is very reminiscent of Lankmar to me. So if you've read that kind of modern fantasy, this is where a lot of those tropes originate from. This first volume is split into three little uh, novellas, and I think all of the books are that way. So if you're buying any of the books, you're not gonna get a large fantasy novel the way you would with a modern book. You're gonna get something that is really kind of rooted in the magazine era, rooted in the pulp era. That is stories that are sh on the shorter end. We're talking novellas, you know, 20,000 words. I put out a lot of 20,000 word books or less, and then collecting them into one story where they all kind of go together. And in this case, they really go together pretty well. So uh, the first story deals with just Fafford. The second story deals with just the Grey Mouser and their origins, where they leave where they're from and end up meeting in the third story, which is in Lankmar. So a little quick overview of what's there. Um, Fafford is a barbarian. He lives with this snow tribe where the women control their husbands and even sons with sorcery of cold and they attack people basically with the weather. And it's all very kind of loosey goosey. It's not really explicit, like she's casting a spell and out comes the ice. It's more, um, 
I don't know, it's, it's more mystical than that, uh, which I think is really interesting. He stays away from the stuff that you might be familiar with with modern fantasy where there's like some sort of hard rules for the magic. That stuff is not part of his writing and that's really not part of Sword and Sorcery, uh, in my opinion and experience. Fafford really doesn't want to live in the snow uh, with this snow tribe. He really wants adventure. He wants to see the world. He wants to see civilization. And they talk about civilization a lot in this book. Like, what is civilization? And, and these are barbarians, and I want to go see civilization. And so he becomes very interested in this actress who's coming in with this um, acting troupe and defends her against his own mother, who's a sorceress, um, and ends up going on a wild adventure that, of course, will take him out of the um, out of the the village that he grew up in off to face adventure and that's really his arc uh, now Fafford is not what i would call a particularly noble character in fact he leaves a woman who he's impregnated behind um, so he's definitely more on the roguish side as far as shirking his responsibilities and going where he chooses going for his own uh, adventures and going to do things for his own sake um, the next story takes place in a completely different area and it focuses on Mouse, who becomes the Grey Mouser. He's quite happy where he's at in contrast to Fafford who wants to get away from where he's at. Um, the Grey Mouser is a sorcerer's apprentice, a, a, a white magic sorcerer. There's white and black magic. Again, one of these tropes that you now is so ingrained into fantasy you don't see like its origins um, you know, maybe decades or even further in the past. So white magic, of course, being like that positive kind of healing magic and black magic being the magic that hurts people, right? So gray mouse or mouse, he has a tendency to, to like that black magic as well and his master tells him so. So he's quite happy doing what he's doing, but something disrupts that. So uh, a local lord ends up killing his master and he now is basically out of the job and his arc in that story is really the quest for revenge and how that ends up panning out i think is quite interesting and i'll leave that resolution to you guys if you want to read it but it really is pretty interesting so the third story is where fafford and the gray mouser finally meet and they meet in uh, lankmar this vast city of smokes and lights uh, where there's night smog and a thieves guild and of course um Fafford is basically following this actress and she has a personal vendetta against the Thieves Guild. She's waging a war against the Thieves Guild, wants to see them utterly destroyed and like wiped off the face of the earth. Now, uh, the Grey Mouser, uh, not so much. He's mostly at this point seeking wealth and adventure for his love, who's really the daughter of the Lord and was also an apprentice for the sorcerer that he served. Um, and so we get this story where they are kind of in a contented place they have some you know Fafford doesn't really take the goal of destroying the thieves guild seriously and and the gray mouser doesn't really have a goal of his own but they meet together and uh, they boast with each other they get drunk and they decide to, to have the sortie against the thieves guild and so that story kind of shows how it all ends up shaking out and it has a very tragic ending and it has a a kind of tragic irony kind of ending. Now, if you don't want spoilers, you can turn this off. You can go read the book um, because I do recommend it. And I think anybody who's interested in writing fantasy or reading fantasy should go take a look at the Fafford and Grey Mouser books by Fritz Leiber. But what happens is while they are out on this sortie, of course, they have attacked some Thieves Guild members and stolen some jewels. This wizard who works for the Thieves Guild uses his sorcerer's magic to kill their girlfriends that they have left behind um their women they left behind in this kind of uh, i guess shabby apartment and so when they return to tell them of their adventures they only get there and realize that like the smog that had been accumulating around the apartment that they couldn't see through was actually a sorceress thing and that like they'd been attacked with magic and these horrible magical rats so they go back quickly to the thieves guild take revenge and kill the wizard now this is an interesting conclusion for a few reasons. Um, first of all, once they kill the, the wizard, like their the heat of battle leaves them. Their bloodlust leaves them, and they run away. Now, they've accomplished their immediate goal, which is to avenge the murderer of uh, these two women that they love. 
But sometimes when you get to that point, you go, well, why didn't they finish the job? Why didn't they finish the job and go kill the Thieves Guild? And the short answer was, before he wrote, before Fritz Leiber wrote this story, he wrote other stories about them in the Thieves Guild. Uh, so there, have to, there has to be a reason for them to come back. But on a, I guess, a motivational level, uh, Fafford, his beef was never really with the Thieves Guild. So once his girlfriend is dead, what is there to do with it? There's sort of a loss of motivation. But I think it's really just a matter of consistency, which is like, there's some stories that take place later that have to do with this Thieves Guild. So we can't just have them walk down the hall and kill the Guild Master and be done with it. Like they have to come to their senses and run away so that we can have another adventure with them later. But that's the first book, Swords and Deviltry. Now, um, as far as my positives and maybe my criticisms of this book, so the first positive really is that these are separate stories. They're very much like uh, the kind of pulp stories that you would read um, far back in the past, things by Robert E. Howard, um, who's, you know, I, that's probably the closest thing, I guess, to uh, to these books. There's so many other authors from the pulp era that uh I can't even remember, like off the top of my head, to talk about. But Robert E. Howard is probably the. If you like Robert E. Howard's stories, you're probably going to like Fafford and the Great Mouser uh, as a continuing. Same thing if you like Michael Moorcock's stories. You're also who has you know, tends to have more, let's say, nuanced heroes and antiheroes. Then you're probably going to like Fafford and the Great Mouser as well. Um, I like the setting. I like the fact that he leans heavily on characters. Um, Fritz Leiber's stories really are character-driven stories. That's why Fafford and the Grey Mouse are such appealing characters. We get to know them as characters. It's the characters that operate the story. There is elements of setting, of course, because the setting is the background, but they're, they're very much in the background. You don't have a lot of explanation about the physical arrangement of the world or even the physical arrangement of uh, Lankmar, this city that they meet in. We just know some general things about it. We get we get kind of an impressionistic sense about the way things are rather than um, concrete ideas about geography. Even with the snow, like the snow people, you have a, a general impressionistic sense of how their society works. We don't meet a whole lot of men, but we, we get an idea of how their social structure works, which is what drives the story. Again, it's the characters. It's, the, it's Fafford's a vengeful mother that's driving really the antagonist of that story and uh, Fafford is like the protagonist trying to I guess get away from his situation so it's really very character driven and the sorcery is an extension of the character's actions and doesn't isn't highly systematized the way that a contemporary writer would probably write about sorcery and magic and those are all things that I uh, really enjoy about his writing. My criticism, and this is just a, a general thing about his style, the way that he writes action is uh, not the way that I prefer to read it, I guess. I, I don't like the way that he writes action all that much. Um, he tends to be very wordy when it comes to describing physical acts. And in some cases, he uses a lot of words to describe something that another writer would do in like one sentence. I'm reminded that I've said this before, the most important element when it comes to writing action is actually the result of the action. That's what the reader cares about. So it's not that big of a flaw. It's mostly like there's several paragraphs and I get kind of confused sometimes with the sequencing. I have to read him two or three times to figure out exactly what he's trying to say. There's just something about the way he says it. He uses maybe too many compound sentences or kind of mixes clauses around that the flow of it just feels awkward whenever I read an action sequence by Fritz Leiber. Uh, but the conclusions are usually pretty easy to figure out. So even if you're one of those that's like, oh, that's confusing, you know what happens, what the result of the action is, and that's really what matters for the story. Um, if you were to read another fantasy author, you know, if you were to read Tolkien or um, someone, um, you know, Tolkien's really good because he does it very broadly. You know, the guy hacked off an orc head or something, or he... he he killed the Nork. They don't say, he doesn't sit there and say he like parried, he thrust his knife arm down, and he brought this one up and he kicked him. And you know, he doesn't describe every action, he just kind of describes the result. Michael Moorcock, likewise, uh, who I mentioned, 
he describes really the result of the action much more than the physics of how that action is uh, happens to be playing out. Now, if you like that blow by blow kind of style of writing, you are gonna love Fritz Leiber. That's not the style of action writing that I uh, necessarily love. I tend, and when I, as a writer, I tend to keep it a little bit lighter as well. So anyway, that's Fafford and the Gray Mouser. Please check it out and leave me your thoughts down below. <coughs> oh, sorry. Sneeze right at the end of the video. Leave me your thoughts down below. I said what you thought about this first book, Swords and Deviltry, and these three stories that are in it. And um, I'll see you guys next time. Have a great one.